Hi guys, so um, just an introduction. Uh, I know some of you already uh, know a bit about this stuff and this is gonna be a very basic introduction. So I hope you'll find something in there for the advanced the guys that already know this stuff. I hope you'll find something in here for yourselves as well. But uh, just bear in mind, this is a very basic introduction to a person that's never done this kind of stuff before. All right, so let's talk about service virtualization. So I've been, my name is Wojtek, and I've been, or some people call me Wojtek, as it's a formal name. Um, and I've been doing software development and testing for more than 10 years now. And um, so I'm wondering who have we got here today? So are there any guys doing automation of any sorts? Awesome. And do we have any guys doing um, manual exploratory testing of this sort of stuff? Awesome. And management kind of roles? Awesome. Good stuff. So you got a fair mix. All right. So what I want to talk about is a problem to start with, and then we'll go to describing a solution people have found for it. So the problem is going to be described in three environments and we'll start with a large enterprise. So we're going to be testing our application here. It's going to be connecting to a fraud detection system and it's a third party system and those guys charge us per transaction. So whenever we're testing our application and we do some, uh, fire some requests against that system, they're going to charge us for uh, those transactions. And our application, sorry guys, uh, our application is also connecting to this user directory system which is available only two days a week for our testing but we need it five, five days a week for our testing and the reason for that is it's running on an old mainframe and we wanted to create a new instance of that system to have it available five days a week for us to so have a copy of that but unfortunately it's too expensive so we're stuck with testing only two days a week and we've also got an account statement system uh, which goes intermittently up and down in the environment where we're using it and there's another problem with that system which is setting up test data takes a long time and um, there's a special team to handle that actually because of the complexity of the data so the problem is it's not only costly but takes takes time and we've also got this new uh, international payment system which we're connecting to the developers have done a great job working with documentation and specifications but that API actually doesn't exist yet it hasn't been implemented so imagine how do you test your application in this kind of environment you're supposed to test that application so that was large enterprises. How would that look like in small to medium enterprises, some typical problems that I have seen? Well, we're gonna have our application again. It's gonna be connecting to an application that we wanna test and it's gonna be connecting to a market data API the a third party that returns market data, current market data. And the problem with that API is you can't tell it to return something. It just returns basically current market data. But you want to test your application in hypothetical situations. For example, what happens if the stock quote uh, uh, drops by 20 points? What happens in your application? And you can't do that actually. We've got another API that we're connecting to, which is uh, the order API. And according to the documentation of that API, we know that um, we've got a lot of error responses that can be returned by the API and we should be doing something about those things. Unfortunately, you can't tell that API to do it for you. So the problem is, how do you test your application in those environments and um, how, do you actually how do you test that your application is going to recover smoothly and present a nice error to the user, let's say, come back later, something like that, rather than just blow up. And we've got this hardware gateway API and the problem with that um, API is that um, we're talking to hardware and the responses take uh, at least 15 seconds to come back. So um, our developers have coded something inside the application that's going to handle that in production. So we, are, we assume that, all right, in production it's going to be more or less the same. But how do you actually test that it's going to work in production? So the problem is we've only got three uh, devices in the test environment, but there's going to be thousands of those in the production environments. And the question is, how do you tell that it's actually going to work? So this is what I've seen happen in small to medium enterprises. And there's one more quick thing about the problem, and then we go straight into the solution. So, uh, mobile, uh, quite similar. We're going to have a mobile application that's connecting to a third party or a backend system. Same things, simulate error messages or error scenarios, error responses, and hypothetical situations as well. But with mobile, there's one more thing, which is the network. And some of you, there's a few tools do that stuff already. Probably you guys uh, could tell me more about it as well. But um, uh, 
situations like what happens if uh, you're with your Lois banking application or something like that and you're on the train and you lose connection because you're in the tunnel and you are just making a money transfer. Those kinds of situations, you don't get that in, in the other environment. So we had a look at this, these three environments, but you can see there's this pattern emerging. There's uh, a family of problems that we have to deal with. And what the industry is doing, they've got a solution for it. And some of you, uh, as far as I already talked to some of you guys, I know you, you already are, are doing those things. Uh, but basically the idea is to introduce another testing phase. So if you imagine uh, creating a new model of an aircraft, what the engineers are going to do, they're going to test the engine in isolation. Then they're going to test, um, uh, make sure the engine works before uh, they start testing uh, the body of the plane in a wind tunnel, then they're going to assemble the thing and only then they're going to fly. They don't, don't go straight into flying an airplane, it's just too complex to, uh, to get it, everything right at the same time. So what happens is we've got these isolated tests uh, being done before we actually assemble everything. And uh, one analogy here is, um, so, so we apply that uh, principle to software testing and it's called test doubles and a subcategory of test doubles are virtual services or doing service virtualization. And uh, an analogy here is if you've got a movie and uh, you're gonna have, let's say, Johnny Depp in the Pirates of Caribbean and he's gonna be flying on a rope over the ship. He doesn't do it, wanna do it himself in the movie. So he's got a gentleman that's got a lookalike that's uh, called a stand double that's gonna pretend to be Johnny Depp just for that particular scene. And together, those two gentlemen are gonna play the whole movie. So this is how we treat it in software development. Um, so, sorry, I've got issues with my clicker. So, going back to the situation we had, how do you, how, how would that look like in our environment where we want to test our application? Well, we're going to create virtual services that are going to pretend to be all of these dependencies for the purpose of uh, testing our application. And um, once we've tested our application in isolation for, uh, so that we're sure that it's actually up to spec and uh, behaving in a certain way that we expect it to behave, uh, according to our expectations and documentation, we can go ahead and test it um, with, in the real environment. Um, so I'm not saying this is what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Uh, all I'm saying is this is one of the things I found myself uh, being useful and many people uh, doing this stuff. So uh, what I'm trying to say is um, this is another tool in your toolbox as a tester and just keep in mind that there is such a thing if you haven't heard about it yet. And maybe you'll find a use for it uh, in your day-to-day -day practice on a project. So is everybody with me so far or am I talking about, some, am I talking about something that, um, everything okay so far? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, so, oh, now you've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> so Wiremog, <laughs> Wiremog's this, Wiremog's this uh, open source tool that is an example of something you could use for service virtualization. And we're gonna have a look at how to do automation with Wiremock. So for those guys, uh, is anybody here that knows Wiremock? Yeah, Tom's, Tom's here. Yeah, all right, so, oh yeah, true. I was there actually, it was last year when Tom was, <laughs> when Tom was here uh, talking about Wiremock. So we're gonna have, a, have another quick look at Wiremock and how you could use it for, to, for do, to do service virtualization in an automated fashion. So I'm gonna go to, um, oh sorry, no, it's actually here. And just bear in mind, it's an introduction. Um, I've got a, another demo later, uh, just there. Um, it's just an introduction, it's a very deep and wide uh, uh, space. Um, we're just gonna look at some basic stuff here. So what we're gonna do is have a simple JUnit test. Anybody know JUnit? So those of you who, yeah, there you go, so awesome. There's at least some people that know this stuff. We're gonna have a JVM running our application and a typical JUnit test case that's gonna be uh, testing our weather application and um, the weather application connects to a third party server. Uh, but we don't want this instability, this dependency in our test. What we want is to simulate that the dependency we're gonna do that with Wiremog, and Wiremog's gonna pretend to be uh, the third party. 
and uh, we're going to use Wiremock APIs from the test to prime or set up the Wiremock instance so that it behaves in a certain way for the purpose of testing our application. So this is going to be a bit of code for a few slides. Um, we've got a JUnit test. We're going to test our application with our application test. Can everybody see that more or less? Yeah. Awesome. So this is a Wiremock rule. This is the Wiremock bit. Uh, this is going to pretend to be the forecast I.O. service. We're going to have our application, the weather application that um, we're going to be testing, the system under test. The usual uh, start and stop setup and teardown methods you'll find in um, unit tests where uh, we're going to uh, start and stop our application. And we can go ahead to the first, um, um, uh, first test where we're going to test uh, that the application serves a wind speed based on um, the response we got from the third party. So we're going to start with an assertion. This is what we expect. We expect to see a wind speed followed by a suffix. And in order to get that wind speed, we actually need to talk to the API. So what we do is use any HTTP clients and we talk to this local host slash wind speed URL. So right now, uh, our test talks to um, the application, but the problem is um, there's nothing there on the other side. It needs to talk to uh, the forecast IO service. So what we'll do is tell Wiremook to pretend to be that service and it's gonna, we're going to say that if you see a get, HTTP GET request with a URL equal to this, you should return a body uh, with this content basically. So this is a simple example of how you could use Wiremook to do um, stubbing service virtualization in an automated fashion in JUnit test. And another example how we do it, simulate an error scenario. So uh, what we want to say is that um, our application reports an error uh, whenever there's a problem with the third party. So we don't want to blow up. We just want to say that um, there's actually say this. So let's just return a 503 HTTP response and a string error to the user um, instead of blowing up. So there's our expectation. Well, what we're going to do is uh, talk again to the wind speed uh, URL and then we have to tell um, Wiremock to uh, pretend that if it gets a uh, if, if the um, forecast audio service got a um, URL um, a get HTTP get request to URL equal to this it should return a server internal error so there we go a simple example of how you could implement a um, error case or simulate a hypothetical situation. And that's how it looks like more or less in Java, the whole thing. So everybody with me still? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what we've got is, there was, there was an, an idea of how you could go about automation. Then if you're doing manual exploratory testing, for example, um, uh, I've got another tool to show you. And for that, I need um, my computer. So what we're going to do is demonstrate something called record playback and we're going to have this finance application uh, that we're going to be testing. It's going to be connecting to a third party API uh, that provides market data and we're going to put this tool called traffic parrot in the middle and it's going to record uh, the traffic. Then we're going to replay, put it into playback mode so it can play back the traffic so we don't need a third party and then we're going to change the data that's been recorded and therefore change the response that gets returned to the user. So I'm going to show you the um, show you the finance application to start with, start it up. Can everybody more or less see that? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So this is the finance application. It's a simple application that fetches, there we go, we got a slow internet connection, but we got it finally. So it fetches the Apple stock um, quote for, from market APIs and presents the last price. So what we can do now is put traffic in, part in the middle between the application and the third party API. So to do that, first of all, I need to start traffic part in another terminal window. I'm going to have to look at the logs just in case something went wrong. No, everything's fine. I can see it started on port localhost 8080. And we're going to see how it looks like in the browser. So I'm going to go straight into recording. And I want to record all traffic that uh, goes to devmarketondemand.com. So now I've got a recorder running locally on localhost 8081 and it's proxying all traffic to dev uh, market on demand APIs. So what we can do now is point our application at this recorder. So I'm going to go back to the terminal. 
stop the application. Um, open the properties files where I can configure the URLs, which is what you'd usually see in uh, Java applications. Change the URL to point to localhost 8081. Start the application again. And go back to the application and refresh the page. So we know it takes a while to come back. Okay, so not much difference here, but uh, right now the application connects to Traffic Pirate and Traffic Pirate pro proxies the traffic to uh, the third party. So if we go to Traffic Pirate, we're gonna see that, there we go, it's recorded traffic, it's recorded a request to this URL. Let's have a look at the guy actually. It's recorded a request to this URL and what it's recorded is a response of uh, status 200 and with these headers, and these, uh, this is the body. And you can see in here, this is the last price that gets presented to the user, actually. So we know uh, from developers that something's, uh, something's supposed to happen if the price drops be uh, below 10. So we're gonna set it to 10.88, save that. Go back to the application, refresh the page, and there we go. So I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's red. So not much going on, but basically what we've tested here is a hypothetical situation. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, a simple demo of how you could uh, do service virtualization in a manual fashion. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of other things you can, uh, you know, uh, do here uh, if you want to get into the details. Like I was saying, it's just an introduction. Um, but um, yeah, let's keep it short. So uh, what we've seen is the f we, we were talking to the finance application uh, that was talking to market data APIs. Uh, we put a tool in the middle, then we put it into uh, playback mode and we've changed uh, what gets presented to the user by changing the recorded uh, traffic. Um, so we had a look at um, the, the automation side, we had a look at how, you could, uh, how this could look like in a manual exploratory testing environment. And we also have some managers in the room. So there's this um, report by Vogue on service virtualization, and just a quick um, you know, flash of what's in it. Uh, this is just a small extract from it, but basically what they say, for example, is that you get a reduced deficit production time. Around 40% people uh, achieve greater than 50% reproduction defect time. So this is huge, right? Or um, reduced total defects. So around 40% uh, respondents uh, achieve greater than 40% uh, number of total defects reduction. So, you know, it speaks for, for itself. And yeah, so keeping it short, that's basically it. Um, uh, what are the next steps for you guys? Um, as I was saying, it's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, basic introduction. Um, I'm happy to do um, an introduction for your company if you feel like um, this would be useful at your company, like a general quick introduction during lunchtime at your company, whether via WebEx or if you're in central London, I can pop in. Um, you can use the tool after the presentation, I've got it, so if you want to play with that. Um, I've also got, um, I haven't got them with me, they're in the bag, uh, Costa vouchers, 10 pound Costa vouchers, a few of those. So if you want to, you know, pop around and uh, get, uh, I'm gathering feedback on our website and the tool. So if you fancy, you know, sharing some feedback, um, um, I've got a gift for that as well. Um, more information on the blog, you can always email me and obviously have a look at Wiremark, the open source tool. Uh, I recommend it whenever I can for, because it's a great tool uh, to use, I use it myself.